This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. NBA free agency begins on Saturday. It is wild. It is happening this soon after the season, but I guess that's the way things go. So we got to talk about it. Got to get you ready for free agency and all that could transpire there by talking to Austin Swain, getting his read on the landscape prior to free agency, which teams he's monitoring, which dominoes are going to fall. Get his read on that. Then I'll talk some NASCAR and Formula One later on. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here, as mentioned by Austin Swain. Check him out on Twitter at aswain 3 Find his work over at NumberFire.com. And Austin, NHL draft last night, NBA free agency. So I know that like... You're just kind of, you have a, your your fingers in a lot of different dishes here. That's not a phrase, but like we're gonna go with it anyway. Sure. So you you just kind of never get an off season, do you? No, it really never feels like I do have an off season. Like theoretically, now is the off season without the mm-hmm. NFL, and it just never feels like an off season for me. By the way, you left out. We had a perfect game last night. Domingo Herman uh, ruining you and I's bets nope. on. Didn't happen. Didn't <laughs> happen. Um, I did not stay up for the end of that game. Woke up. Saw the push notification. There was a perfect game. I was like, I'm guessing my A's money line did not hit. Yeah, that was my first indication that that bet did not work out. You know, it's uh, at least I don't have to like sweat as I open the ESPN app check scores. That's nice. Yeah, it was like eight nothing, and I took the Athletics first five specifically looking to target Herman. So not the best day for targeting the Oakland Athletics for you and I. We probably should have anticipated that. Although this is not a bet I gave out on the podcast, but we were talking uh, last week about yeah. how I had my my numbers had shown value on the Rockies yep. 13 times since May 2nd, and they had lost every single game. Last night, they finally won in a game where I had value on them. <laughs> of course, it wasn't one I discussed on the show, because why would it be? Uh, but like it finally happened. So I guess maybe I have to thank you for yep. your Rockies finally coming through for the first time in a decade for when sure. my numbers showed value on them. For sure. I'm headed to Coors Field tonight, too. So I'll be oh. at Dodgers Rockies here on Thursday. And not not enough games league wide to care about. Yeah. So I'll, I'll head to the ballpark tonight. I love it. Pitching matchup. Chase Anderson, Emmett Sheehan. What more could you possibly ask Hit for three. there? Um, <laughs> Nolan Jones. Dinger call for today on the solo shot. So uh, hopefully we'll get some uh, some long balls out there. I'll lock that in. I'll lock that in. All right. I like it. Brandon Nimmo is the other one. He's five to one. I can only get five to one here, so I didn't take that. But, you know, regardless, those are the dinger. We're going to talk about some NBA free agency here. Get you ready for that here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast, despite my terrible A's recommendation yesterday. Plus more MLB betting recommendations on tomorrow's show to get that. And all these shows as they go live, make sure you're subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you you get your podcast. Let's dive in now and talk some NBA Austin with free agency beginning on Saturday. So I kind of want to just kind of do an overall primer from you, getting your read on the big dominoes to fall, which teams are monitoring most and stuff like that. Let's begin things off here with those big dominoes, whether it's trades that could occur, signings, what are the biggest moves you're watching Mm -hmm. as we get set for free agency on Saturday? So I, I kind of see the NBA title picture right now as a bubble with cert, or maybe a nightclub with certain people allowed in, right? We've got the defending champion Nuggets. They are in. They could contend to win the title next year. Phoenix made a move for Bradley Beal. They are in. They could potentially win the title next year. Boston already got Kristaps Porzingis. You and I talked about that last week. I think the only remaining domino that could fall that could create someone else in that bubble is the Damian Lillard trade out of Portland. And it, it might be forgiving for one of these contenders if Portland is really willing to strip down to the bare bones, just kind of reload like we saw the Spurs do. Uh, I, I have two key spots I'm watching for Damian Lillard. Obviously, the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals with seemingly a deficit of talent. You know, if they can add his scoring, his backcourt scoring to Bam Adebayo, Jimmy Butler, those guys that do the dirty work, that is like an, a supersized upgrade. Uh, of Gabe Vincent for them. And then Philadelphia, we don't really know what's going to happen with James Harden. I'll talk about that here in a second, but um, you, you talk about Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray with this elite pick and roll, Damian Lillard, Joel Embiid would be right up there. So those guys would immediately vault into that sort of title contender sphere. So I think that's the biggest domino to at play. Just watching where Damian Lillard winds up is the thing you're kind of like most focused on right now. 
Yeah, I think that's when you're talking about implications for actually winning the title next year. There are a few key free agents, you know, some good teams could add contenders, but like that is the biggest domino. And then obviously we're watching some of the big names in free agency. I think three that could shift that landscape, you know, maybe buff a contender, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Draymond Green. I don't think Kyrie at this point is on the move. It seems pretty exclusively down to Dallas or maybe a Lakers reunion with LeBron as a long shot, but James Harden, Draymond Green linked to a lot of different places um, could significantly impact the playoff picture and who we're target targeting to win the conference, looking at win totals for certain teams as well. Now you mentioned how the Damian Lillard trade could mix up the futures market with the finals, uh, yeah. conference finals and stuff like that. So let's take a look here and talk about teams you may want to invest in right now, whether to win the NBA finals, win their respective conference, whatever it may be, because there's going to be an inflection point Saturday. The question is, who benefits from yeah. that inflection point? So are there teams right now, Austin, that you want to potentially buy into in order to get in front of any potential moves they may make? Yeah, so the one team that I really think would become all of a sudden a dark horse to win the Western Conference and maybe even the NBA Finals, the Sacramento Kings, which you and I have talked about on the pod, I wasn't super enthusiastic about their playoff run, but you have to take in the data of how impressive they were going head-to-head with the Warriors last year. Um they can open up about 30 million in cap space if they renounce Harrison Barnes, some other insignificant pieces on their bench. And when I look at the Kings to potentially win the West, I'm obviously talking about the fit with Draymond Green, former Warriors assistant Mike Brown, the head coach in Sacramento now. And Draymond is a picture perfect guy that you would want to put next to Domantis Sabonis because he brings a little bit of that defense, that toughness, a little bit of that rim protection. Um, I, I doubted the Kings because of that element. Their defensive rating was in the bottom 10 of the NBA last year. Well, Draymond is one of the best glue guys defensively in the 21st century. So I think Draymond here would be a significant step forward for the Kings. They could also add other guys at the four, like PJ Washington, Grant Williams. You know, they are the team that has the potential and flexibility to open up cap space. And by the way, they're the team that has the youth. They have the potential to grow. Uh, I think Draymond would be a perfect fit. And um, that's to me, that is where I would want to invest before free agency, because it's a little up in the air, what happens with Draymond, and I don't think that's being accounted for in this number here to win the West. We also did get a Brian Windhorst, why would they do that situation with the Kings clearing up Cavs space? That was uh, last week, so uh, connecting the dots there as well. I think he was talking specifically about Draymond there. Kings currently 24 to 1 to win the West. Do you think that fully accounts for the open-endedness here where maybe they strike out in free agency and stuff like that? Because there's a wide range of outcomes here. Do you think the 24 to 1 number already accounts for that and thus makes them a good investment right now to win the West. Yeah, I don't know. If, I, I don't think there is any way that Sacramento could could strike out in free agency because if they waive Harrison Barnes, then essentially they're just tasked with replacing what was very, very much mid-level production. So um, as long as they land someone in that four spot, Keegan Murray, they were hoping to grow his role this year. Uh, Malik Monk, get him more time on the court. So Barnes almost leaving the team is, is a positive for some of the initiatives that they're trying to do. I don't think this number believes that the Kings can actually land Draymond Green. I feel like sure. at this point, if you search Dream- Draymond Green's individual market, he's still more than likely going to end up with the Golden State Warriors is what a lot of markets are saying. Uh, there are a lot of other open-ended teams that he could potentially, he's meeting in Portland with Damian Lillard, which is kind of interesting and weird because I don't think that's a title team either, Dame. Uh, but, yeah, but you know, I don't think that this number at this point does reflect the possibility of how much I love the core of this team if they get Draymond. Was that your pitch for for Lillard to officially leave and go to Miami, your East Coast team? Yeah, I gotta be. I I gotta be honest. I I just am tired of talking about it. Like Dame yeah, was talking right. about, I want to I want to resign Jeremy Grant and do this, and we'll be able to contend. It's like, dude, it's just not working. Like, there's yeah. just not like you have to make up the. You're either gonna be longevity guy or you're gonna do what every other NBA star does and try to team up and win a title. I I'm so tired of the Damian Lillard discussion. To be truthful, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So we like the Kings 24 to one to win the West. Any other teams you want to buy into Austin before free agency begins? 
so there's only one team that wins the finals, two teams that win the conferences, but like a team that I will be bullish on to, as far as their win total when those are released, the Houston Rockets. They have the most cap space in the NBA right now. They Last year, my largest wager was Sacramento Kings over because of some of the pieces they added in free agency. They traded for Zabonis. The Rockets have added to me what is the most important part, which is they go from the worst coaching situation in the league to now Ime Udoka, a guy that got to the finals, kind of a no-nonsense defense-first guy. And then we're looking at what they could potentially do in free agency. Of course, they are linked all over to James Harden because Harden still has a significant personal imprint in Houston. They're linked to Fred Van Vliet, which would be more of a play on youth in that same type of ball-centric role. And I think that's really what they've been missing. They need a guy that unquestionably, this is the guy that is taking the last shot of the game. This is who the ball's hands is in late in close games. And they've just kind of haven't had that. And um, they will be, have the ability to spend. I think they had a great draft when they got Cam Whitmore at 20. Um, you know, I think, uh, Thompson, the point guard they got at four is, is a little ways away from being an NBA contributor, like in, in full, but Whitmore's a good knockdown shooter already. They're trying to move off some young pieces. They still have a few questions to answer. Like, what are you going to do without Perrin Shingun? He's a great offensive player, but really you will have a bottom 10 defense if that is the guy you're asking for rim protection. And, you know, what do you do with the young guards you already have? Kevin Porter Jr., Jalen Green. I think it'd be perfect to bring Jalen Green off the bench, but then do you kind of sour him about potentially losing your second overall pick from a few years ago? So they have a lot of questions, but they, they are a core and a new nucleus that is building and importantly uh you and i were talking i think yesterday i I showed you there are only like five teams that currently have nba cap space houston has a bunch and they've already got a lot of good players they're 250 to one to win the west i'm assuming that's a bridge too far for you correct (laughs) yeah they you know they are way too young to make that leap but you talk about the leap oklahoma city made last year where we thought they'd be one of the worst teams in the league left into the play in that's more of the forecast that i would have for houston so maybe even a to make the play in future if we got those available on sportsbook decently soon yeah i'm assuming win totals will be up probably later july or so uh if i had to guess uh and to make the playoff stuff probably shortly thereafter so the rockets may be a team to monitor there as mentioned we don't have win totals up yet uh so this is a bit tougher to actually like fade a team but i still think it's important to discuss teams that you think might see their value decrease because there still is a ripple effect of that so when you're talking about teams right now where you want to I mean if you can hypothetically fade them fade them which teams do you think could have outlooks that could get grimmer in the next week or so. So I think it's a couple of teams that are already pretty popular. So you're not dealing with a lot of value as is. Like it's really hard to get value on the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl because a lot of people are betting the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl every single year. Um, I still wound league. up doing that a couple of times. So maybe that's it, it just happen. Me. My you know, numbers but, always love the Cowboys, and they kind of do again this year. So I'll just hide. <laughs> I'll hide my head in shame while you talk. <laughs> well, you know, Jim, you definitely not a Cowboys fan. So, but a couple of places I'm looking are teams that I'm genuinely concerned about. It's not just because they're popular. First, I look at the Golden State Warriors. Last week, I, I said on Twitter, I am so concerned about the trade that they made sending Jordan Poole to Washington. They got Chris Paul back. I can't think of anybody that fits less in the NBA than Chris Paul into what Golden State does. High motion offense, a lot of set plays. Chris Paul likes to drag the ball up the floor, run a pick and roll, and shoot a mid-range jumper. It's like the opposite of what has built this Golden State Warriors dynasty. And it's starting to sound like they just kind of dumped Jordan Poole on a personality fit. Um you really can't dump somebody for nothing at this point. And CP3 is not nothing, but especially if they lose Draymond Green in free agency. I was just talking about Sacramento. If I was Draymond Green, I'd rather play with the Kings next year as far as having a chance to win the title now after that Chris Ball move. Because if they lose Draymond, their defensive rating last year without him was 119.2. That was the second worst mark in the NBA. It was terrible. And Jordan Poole carried this team through some of the stretches. You know, Steph Curry's getting up there. Klay Thompson's getting up there. They miss games. And Chris Paul, by the way, is going to miss games as well. He only played 59 games last year. And Jordan Poole won't be there to carry the offense in, in their stead anymore. So I'm really concerned about the Warriors moving into next season. And they're right on the short list to win the title because of their longevity. But I don't see this team with that, those aspirations. Yeah, right now the Warriors 12 to 1 to win the NBA Finals, 6 to 1 to win the Western Conference. And you talked about the Nuggets and potentially being a uh, team that's worthy of plus 460 or so a couple weeks ago, or the Celtics, I should say, and the, the Nuggets there plus 470. Implications there is that there may be more value at the top end and also does help with the Kings' future, too. Okay, so we are low on the Warriors. Which other teams to you carry red flags entering this weekend? 
why, why don't we just take one stop down there on the overall championship odds? I'm looking at the Los Angeles Lakers as well. I think this is a pivotal moment for them to make a decision that may not make their fan base incredibly happy. But if you're going to be a title contender, are, they're apparently willing to back up the Brinks truck to keep Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura. And my question to that is, really? Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura? Because you potentially would be losing D'Angelo Russell in that situation. And it's just really odd to me that you would then get rid of your financial flexibility to lock up a team that was good. They were sixth in net rating, plus 4.8 after the trade deadline last year. But that wasn't a juggernaut. And we saw their deficiencies and shortcomings athletically against the Nuggets. And the reality of the team is the same. LeBron, still old still hurt, starting to post photoshops of him playing with his son next year. So he's not very interested. Anthony Davis is always hurt. He's inconsistent. And when they're gone, now you have a worse depleted roster behind them. I think they absolutely need to swing for the fences about trying to recruit a Kyrie Irving, about trying to recruit a James Harden and then maybe lean more on mid-level talent. I know the Lakers want to get younger, but it's also about the right youth pieces, right? I don't think you should lock in a team that's ceiling at best is maybe the third, fourth, fifth best team in the Western Conference next year and getting worse. Yeah, Lakers 15 to 1 right now to win the NBA Finals in the West. Uh, they are currently 850 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. All right, so we're buying into the Kings right now and potentially buying the Rockets once we get uh, non-upside markets posted at some point. And then also checking out the Dame Lillard situation. Lower on the Warriors, lower on the Lakers as of right now. That is Austin Swain. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at aswain3. Find all of his work over at numberfire.com. Austin, enjoy this weekend. Hopefully you can get some rest time, despite the fact there is no offseason for you. And we'll talk to you. Actually, I won't talk to you, but you'll talk to everyone on Monday because you're filling in for me on covering the spread all of next week outside of Tuesday for July 4th. So I uh, appreciate getting a little uh, primer in for you as well here. Yeah, so NASCAR this weekend moving to the Chicago greater area. You'll talk about that. Jim Sonis moving to the greater Midwest Chicago area. So a yep. couple things in line there. I can't wait to talk to you guys. We'll have baseball stuff with we'll NASCAR, PGA, UFC, big fight card next week. So it'll be a lot of fun filling in for you. I do miss out on the street course because we're not leaving until Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but I it was partly to miss traffic. I'm not going to yep. lie. Like yep. younger me had been like, okay, we got to move right away so I can get there before the race. Now I'm like, I don't want to go through traffic. So I'm going later. Yeah. So I'm old is the takeaway here. All right. Again, check out Austin on Twitter at AceWayne3. Austin, I appreciate you. And thank you in advance for covering for me next week as well. Sounds Again, good, yeah. find Austin on Twitter at AceWayne3. Find his work over at numberfire.com. As he mentioned, we'll talk about that NASCAR street race in Chicago. We'll talk some Formula One in Austria in just one second. But first, baseball season is in full swing. And there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. So don't miss your chance to snag a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 533-42 in Connecticut. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700. We're in Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Massachusetts, gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. In New York, 1-877-HOPE-NY or text OPEN-Y. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's begin things here with Formula One. They are in Austria for this week. It is a sprint race weekend, so a bit different schedule than usual. Practice will be tomorrow and qualifying tomorrow as well for the race. Then they'll have sprint qualifying and a sprint race on Saturday. Now, that race on Saturday will not impact the starting grid for Sunday. That'll be fully set on Friday. It's confusing, I know, but just so you know, one practice, one qualifying session, both on Friday and the race coming up on Sunday. 
there is a slight chance of rain in the forecast, but doesn't look like it's uh, likely enough where I'm going to abandon my model. So as of right now, I've got two guys showing values being uh, values to finish inside the points for Sunday. Those guys are Yuki Sonoda and Nico Hulkenberg. Both those guys are three to one at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's begin with Sonoda because we talked about him before Canada two weeks ago, and that one did not go well. But Sonoda's had a good season overall, and his like lap pace, his like median lap time in Canada, still was not terrible. Just made a bunch of mistakes that really ruined his day, and that's still possible because in the past Sonoda's been a bit erratic. But the pace had been trending up before that race. And Sonoda's finished inside the points in 25% of races so far this year. He had another where in Barcelona where he finished inside the top 10, but then later got dropped back due to a penalty. Doesn't count because penalties do matter and you got a penalty for a reason. So we can't count that and artificially inflate his number. But Sonoda has finished 11th, three other races beyond Barcelona. So I would say, based on what Sonoda's been doing, he has been too consistently right in this range to ignore him when his odds are three to one. The implied odds there are 25%. I've got Sonoda above that. So I am very okay with Yuki Sonoda for a top 10. That is three to one right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook for this weekend. The second top 10 bet, as mentioned, is Nico Hukenberg uh, for Haas. And Hukenberg, the pace has primarily come on Saturdays, not Sundays. So that's not ideal if we're trying to bet this guy to finish inside the points on Sunday. Hulkenberg just one top 10 for Haas so far this year, and that came in Australia, which was a chaos-filled race. That really shouldn't count. You need a lot of chaos to get there. That's always possible, though. I think overall this year, this Formula season is Formula One season has been pretty low chaos, not a lot of retirements, and you kind of expect regression at some point there. Hulkenberg has had speed, though, in qualifying. He's made it to Q3 in five out of eight races. My model doesn't care about that personally. It cares about what you do during the race. It's looking at just his pace during the races. And it still thinks that Hulkenberg is undervalued to finish inside the top 10. The pace in Canada was awful. It was probably the worst it's been all year. So maybe that was a sign of things to come as teams like McLaren bringing upgrades this week, or at least to Lando Norris's car. Other teams may have gotten better. Alfa Romeo's gotten a little bit better at times. Uh, Hulkenberg's teammate Kevin Magnuson was also slow in Canada, but I think three to one is long enough to account for that. So personally, what I want to do here is take both these, take both uh, Hulkenberg and Sonoda at three to one to finish top 10. And I think that there's decent odds that one of them does wind up hitting between the two. I prefer Sonoda. So if you want to go with just one bet, I would go with Sonoda over Hulkenberg. But personally, my personal prof- preference is to go with both Sonoda and Hulkenberg top 10 plus 300 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I think that's the right way to play things for this week. So for Austria, not seeing a lot for outrights because why would I outside of Max Verstappen? Um, not seeing a whole lot for podiums or uh, T6s. I either. think those markets are pretty efficient, but I do like Sonoda and Hulkenberg 3-1 to one to finish inside the top 10. As for NASCAR, as mentioned, pretty unique event this weekend. They're going to Chicago and they're racing through the streets. This is the first street race in NASCAR Cup Series history. They've never raced this course, so it is hard to know what to expect. And that impacts stuff for me because I'm trying to model stuff. There's obviously going to be an element of guesswork inherently involved here because we've never seen it before. For me personally, I'm pulling in road course data for drivers, but modeling it similar to a super speedway. So what I mean by that is the driver ratings, like their baseline numbers, are based on what they've done on road courses. And road courses are different than street courses, but it's at least the best baseline that we've got. But from a modeling perspective, I've got the incident rates of a super speedway and there is a variance of a super speedway. So even if the guys who do survive and don't wreck, there's a lot of variance inside their finishing positions as well. The track here is super narrow. So if there is an incident, it could involve multiple cars. And that's my concern and why the incident rate pretty high. And it sounds like drivers have had a hard time not wrecking by themselves in the simulators. Denny Hamlin was saying in his podcast on Monday that he's been in the sim and he had like an hour where he couldn't get past turn four without wrecking. It's like me playing F1 2022 where I'm trying to do qualifying and just can't make it through a whole lap without wrecking. So I could be wrong on this. Very much possible. So I want to account for that when betting. And what that means is I want a pretty decent edge before I take the plunge on an outright, because the error margin of my model is higher this week than usual. And I have to account for that by 
taking only the spots that are good values, and typically that will be on somewhat longer odds. There are some bets that pop up, though, when taking that approach. My favorite bet of this week is actually an outright, and that's for Michael McDowell to win at 25-1 to over at FanDuel Sports. If you remember from Sonoma, I was on McDowell there as well, and... He was pretty good during that race. He was 40 to one at open. He shortened to 14 to one after he qualified third for that race. And McDowell was not as fast as Martin Truex Jr. was not as fast as Denny Hamlin, but he was probably in that second tier of drivers. I think that he had a top five car for that day. And he could have had a shot late because there was a caution. People were bunched up in traffic, but McDowell's pit crew made a mistake on a late pit stop. And he went from around the top five to outside the top 10. McDowell did rebound and finish seventh, but it was a pretty big bummer to have a 40 to one ticket on a guy and have an actual shot, but then have it taken away that late in the race. Overall, we've run eight races on road courses in the next gen era, and McDowell has five top tens. He's had a top 10 average run position in six of those races. And if there's a bit more chaos, it'll better allow McDowell to compete with guys like Truex, the JGR cars, and the Hendrick cars of Larson and Elliott. I have McDowell pretty well above his implied odds of 3.9%. He is 7.4% from me. That's a red flag because if your model's way off in the market, typically you're wrong, not the market. So I'm probably too high in McDowell, but I think the market's also probably too low. It's probably somewhere in between where I've got him, where the market has him. So I will take 25 to 1 on McDowell to win this race. I feel pretty good about that. And I think that accounts for the stuff we discussed, where it could be a high variance race. There's a lot of unknowns, but it's a guy who's run well on road courses, but maybe could benefit from a bit of chaos if that were to happen in Sunday's race. I also do like Daniel Suarez at the same number, 25 to 1. Suarez has crashed a lot outside of his win in Sonoma last year. He's finished outside the top 20 in five out of eight next gen road course races. But the three races where he did not finish poorly, he finished first, fifth, and fifth. I don't mind volatility if you can hit the highs. And Suarez has shown that he can. He had a good car at Circuit of the Americas this year. It did crash there, but at a, a seventh place average running position. He messed up his car in the first lap at Sonoma and never really rebounded, but did qualify well there. So this year, there's been speed for Suarez despite bad results. I have Suarez at 6.8% to win. His implied odds are 3.9%. So I'm okay adding him at 25 to one as well. The same caveats with McDowell apply to Suarez, where if I'm way off in the market, I'm more likely to be wrong than the market is. So keep that in mind. But I do like Suarez 25 to one to win this race. The final bet is on a top 10, and that is going to be Austin Dillon at plus 470. There are a bunch of drivers at plus 470 at FanDuel Sportsbook for this race. And I think of those guys at plus 470, I've got value on a couple. My favorite one is Dillon, though, because he is the one I am furthest off from the market. Dylan had, does have two top tens in those eight next gen road course races. So that's a 25% rate. His implied odds here are 17.5%. Dylan finished 19th in Sonoma, but he qualified well, but had a spin during the race. It was his fault. Um, so, you know, mistakes matter and he made a pretty big mistake. So it was his fault, not a fluke. He did still rebound to finish 19th. So I think that was pretty impressive. He has improved overall road courses, and the two actual top 10s for Dylan came at Circuit of the Americas and Charlotte. Both those are, are spots where you've got like a big bunch-up zone on the track, and that can lead to more variance. So if we get more variance, more chaos here, it'd be guys like Austin Dillon, the longer shots, who would benefit. So I think Dylan's a good bet. Um, I'm not betting any short odds for top 10s right now. I don't show value in any of those right now, but I do show value here. I have Dylan 26% for a top 10. And I think that, uh, I think we should be above his implied odds of plus 470, given the unknowns around this race. I also don't mind Ryan Priest at plus 470. I have Priest at 21.6%, but the edge is bigger on Dylan than on Priest. So I'll go with Dylan for right now. So in the Cup Series, favorite bets are McDowell 25 to 1, Suarez 25 to 1, both those to win, Austin Dillon plus 470 for a top 10. The Xfinity Series race is also super interesting because Cup drivers are not allowed to run this race because they don't want them to have an edge over the others when they run on Sunday. And this is just like a personal thing. I don't think any of the Xfinity drivers, the regulars, are that good on road courses. Like they lost AJ Allmendinger. They lost Ty Gibbs. They lost the best road course racers to the Cup Series this past year. 
They ran the Portland race similar earlier this year where there were no cup drivers. Cole Custer won that race. I bet Custer for that one. I think that he is a pretty good road course racer, but he's not elite. He's plus 450. I can't get there. I think this race is decently wide open. The one guy I'm showing value on right now is Austin Hill. He is 11 to 1 to win a FanDuel, and I think you can get a bit longer by shopping around. And I do like Hill enough to bet him at that number. His implied odds are 8.3%. Hill has run nine Xfinity Series races on road courses in his career. And he has four top fives in that span. And a lot of those came against stiffer competition than what he'll have in this race. Because even if it's in Portland, no uh, Cup Series regulars there, but it was eighth in Sonoma with a bunch of Cup regulars in that race. 11 to 1 is, is a bit short for a high chaos race. But again, I don't think anybody in this field is great at road courses. And Hill has shown he can run a front, even in tougher fields, on road courses. So I'm pretty good locking him in at 11 to 1. Honestly, that's the only value I see as of right now. It's a pretty thin week for extended. Even looking at top five markets of other sports books, I don't see a whole lot I want to take. So for me, I'm going to hold Pat here with just Austin Hill to win 11 to 1 in the Xfinity series for this week. So pretty thin card there, but uh, hopefully a bit more on Sunday via the cup series. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread one. And once again, to give a big thank you to Austin Swain for swinging by breaking down his thoughts on NBA free agency, find him on Twitter at a Swain three. Uh, if you got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. Do you want to thank you all for tuning in as always make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread, wherever you get your podcast. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating. Also check us out over on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on FanDuel TV+. Plus. We'll talk to you all once again tomorrow for some more Major League Baseball. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.